a lot of what I have to say is not going to be big and visionary and inspiring because I want to talk about what has happened in the past couple of weeks in Gaza and internationally, what is happening right now and what might happen in the next few weeks. Um, however, however, uh, everything I say will be um, louder. Yeah. Okay, louder. Everything I say uh, will be informed by the principles that Barney laid out and by some of the things that Phil said about the centrality of Palestinian resistance. That is the theme underlying, underlying all of this. And um, really, it's something that's never mentioned. If you switch on the TV, so something, something's happening in somewhere in the world, but switch on the TV and watch the news and try to make sense of it. And that hasn't been working. Hasn't been working at all. You switch on BBC, you just get garbage. Switch on Sky, slightly better, still garbage. If you're lucky enough to get Al Jazeera, you might start to get some idea of what's going on. But I wanted to go through all of that because I think there are, there are details that are obfuscated and missed. And once you start seeing what is going on, not from the point of view of the BBC, Washington, the big powers, but from the point of view of people from below, then all of a sudden this confusing picture starts to clarify. Now, I, 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 I hope I'll live up to that, that, that claim. And I also want to end on um, another theme that Barnaby mentioned, which is the end days of Western imperialism, which might sound like an extraordinary thing to say, but I, 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 I think, I think we, are, we, are, we, are, we are in that period now. So, okay, <coughs> let's, let's just go back to the last few weeks. Um, uh, we, have a, we have a very big march on the arms this day, and uh, it led to a series of dominoes falling that have led to government ministers being sacked, Richie Sunak effectively demoting himself and putting Cameron back in charge and so on. And we had another march the next Saturday, because we've been marching every Saturday for the last few, uh, last few weeks now. Um, and then something amazing happened. We've been on the streets saying, cease fire now, cease fire now, cease fire now. And the government and Washington was going, no, we can't have a ceasefire now. And yet suddenly, that next Saturday after the, the big march, there was a ceasefire. There was a ceasefire deal a few days before, seemed to be holding, hostages were getting exchanged. What happened? What happened? Now, if you look back to when the US and Britain and Starmer and Sunak, of course, uh, were refusing and saying, no, we can't have a ceasefire now. If you look, actually looked at their arguments, their central argument was this, we can't have a ceasefire because that would involve the US and Israel sitting around a table with Hamas and cutting a deal. And that is unconscionable. That is repugnant, to use the White, White House's word. It is repugnant to call for a ceasefire because that would mean we were negotiating with Hamas, who were, of course, the equivalent of ISIS. You know, they kept saying Hamas equals ISIS. They kept saying that. You remember that. They're not saying that anymore. Why? Because it turns out they did sit down and do a deal. So they can't now just pretend that Hamas is some weird, irrational force caught up in some, you know, some strange religious, cultish fanaticism. They're clearly people that you can do business with, and they did do business with it. So... So that was one of the reasons why I think it was very important to understand that that ceasefire deal was actually a ceasefire. We were calling ceasefire now, and they were refusing it, but actually they were forced to cut the deal. It was a temporary one. It lasted about a week or so. There was a potential to extend it. It could have been extended further, but it wasn't. So what happened there? Why, why, why did that deal happen, and why did it fall apart? In terms of why it happened, there was obviously, obviously, uh, there was a huge international backlash against the US and against Israel. We saw that with the huge demonstrations everywhere in the world, uh, in, in extraordinary places. You know, I mean, I, I was like, I did, really didn't know that there were demonstrations. Like, there was a demonstration in like some of the most re remotest, remotest territories in Canada, and I was like counting the number of people on this demonstration and going to Wikipedia to see how many people actually lived there. And it's like 10% of that city <laughs> just had a demonstration for Palestine in the northwestern territories of, of Canada. So <clears throat> it was global. And 
America's strategy over the past few, well, I call it a strategy, it's, it's, over, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's hardly that. It's, its way of dealing with Israel was like, okay, the, the, we'll just let the Israelis do whatever they like to the Palestinians. The Palestinians don't seem to be a problem at the moment. And we'll just patch up a load of diplomatic deals between you know, UAE and Israel, normalise things on a diplomatic level, and we can just carry on forever. And of course that hasn't happened, that hasn't worked. All of those deals are now being ripped up. The entire world has polarised against the US, Israel, and the core imperial states, Germany, Britain, France. France already was dissenting openly, saying, no, actually, a ceasefire would be a very good idea. Can we have a ceasefire, please? And, of course, that, that was putting a great deal of pressure on the states, which is something I'll come back to, back to later, because the US does see China as its main threat, and does want to take on China, and take on Iran, and take on Russia, and take, all of, take on all of its, what it sees as a threat. But he wants to do that with a large number of allies, at a time of its own choosing. And, you know, preferably in a sort of vaguely popular way. You know, it was, look, it was denouncing Putin's invasion of, of, of Ukraine. It was saying, look, this is awful. This is terrible what he's doing. It was going round to every other country in the world going, did you see what Putin's doing to, it, to Ukraine? Did you see that? You don't want to get too close to that guy. Don't want to get too close to that guy. Come back to Uncle Sam. We'll look after you. Now, all of that is gone. All of that is gone. So America faced extraordinary pressure to actually do something about this and actually halt what is going on. That wasn't the main thing that brought them to the table, though. There was also the fact that the war is going very badly for Israel. None of its war aims make any sense. It's meant to be eradicating Hamas militarily and politically. Now, what that means in Israel's mind is that the civilian infrastructure and the governmental infrastructure of Gaza and Hamas and any Palestinian resistance group or any kind of expression of Palestinian civic, civic politics at all, all counts as Hamas and we can blow up the lot of them. That is why it is targeting hospitals. That is why it is targeting universities. That is why it has blown up the parliament building in, in Gaza. That is why it has blown up the courts of justice. And, you know, it actually films this and puts it out, saying, oh, we just blew up the courts of justice in Gaza. Yay us. We are, we are, we are standard bearers for civilization. Now, you know, um, that was what they were trying to do. But in terms of actually getting rid of Hamas, they, they, they've clearly failed. Clearly failed, you know? I mean, they, they, they blew up this hospital, and then there's meant to be tunnels underneath. And, and the US president went and covered that lie. He said, oh, yes, yes, I've seen the intelligence. There are, there's this big tunnel complex. There, there was no tunnel complex. So America could see that the war was going very badly for Israel. Israel was being humiliated on the war stage. was forced to do stupid stunts. Couldn't actually, couldn't actually get anyone. For, and couldn't actually deliver on this promise of get rid of, getting rid of Hamas. So the Palestinian resistance, the Palestinian ability to actually keep together its, its kind of political infrastructure in the face of this onslaught was what finally tipped things and the US came to the table. Now, so there was a ceasefire deal. It involved the hostage swap and that started to happen. How did the US square the circle of, well, we just said that there wouldn't be a ceasefire deal and we wouldn't negotiate with Hamas, but we just did that. Well, what they did is like, a, oh, that wasn't a ceasefire. No, this is, this is a pause. A humanitarian pause. You know, you know, we were talking about the humanitarian pause afterwards. You know, you were saying, "What the hell is that? Why is that not a ceasefire?" This is what we were meaning by it. It's rubbish, of course. If you read what they were proposing in terms of humanitarian pause prior to the ceasefire, they were talking about four hours a day. They were talking about the uh, the Israelis being able to bomb away, bomb away, four hours a day to get refugee trucks in and so on. You know, this is kind of what they've done in Ukraine. They could just put the war on simmer and keep it going for as long as they wanted. That is what they meant by humanitarian pause. That is what Starmer meant by humanitarian pause. What we've got instead is something very different. An extended period of time. I mean, there was a beautiful, beautiful video that came out, that was put up uh, like on the first day of, of, the, of the bomb stop with this young kid in Gaza who basically was just astonished for the first time in his life. There, the sky was blue and there were no drones and no planes. And he was just like, life is beautiful. I want things to be like this. 
And those few days of respite, I think the entire world that had been hit and hit was punch drunk from the extraordinary violence of the images it saw on the TV, managed to kind of pull itself together and go, wait, wait, this is just, this has to stop. And so people got themselves together and just started screaming at the Americans, we cannot go back to that bombing. We cannot go back to that carnage. And you know what? This is another thing that people often miss. They often miss this. The relationship between the US and Israel is not one of, you know, the Israelis secretly controlling the US. Of course it's not that. But neither is it one of the US simply telling the Israel what to do. You know, it, it does tell Israel what to do, but whether Israel listens or not, Israel has its own agenda. It, Israel has several agendas at the moment. It's not a unified country at all. It's not a unified state with a particular vision of what it wants to do. It is split asunder with warring factions who hate each other more than, more than, more than anything else. So, America sort of thought, said, right, okay, we've got a ceasefire now. It's a rolling program. It could be extended. We could push it. And Hamas was offering, we exchange all the prisoners for all your prisoners. That was an offer on the table. And the US was yelling and yelling and yelling at Israel to take up that offer. And that's why you'll notice that it was talking up, oh, yes, this humanitarian cause aren't we humanitarian? We must do something about the civilians. It wanted that deal to continue, but the deal <coughs> did not continue. And why did that happen? Now, to understand that, I think we have to see that if Hamas had actually continued that deal and there had been an all for all, or like, you know, all the hostages were returned in, in return for a large, large number of Palestinian prisoners. The world would have looked at that and they would have said, Hamas has won this war. This is meant to be a war between Israel and Hamas. That's what we're told. Israel versus Hamas. War. What was Israel's war aim? It was to get rid of Hamas. Well, Hamas is still there, so Israel has not won its war aim. What was Hamas's war aim? Well, Hamas's war aim, openly proclaimed, is we're going to take loads of hostages and we're going to switch them and release the prisoners from our jails. So Hamas would have won. And that is why Israel, despite being yelled at by the states to cut a deal, could not do it. Because if it would have happened, it would have been a national humiliation for Israel. And that, I believe, is why they restarted against the will of the states. And that is very crucial, because that is now brings us to where we are now. And I think we are in an extraordinary situation. Because the United States has basically been yelling at its watchdog, its rabid dog, to come to heel. Dog ain't listening. The bombs have restarted. <coughs> Blinken, the uh, secretary, uh, Bill, yeah, he came back after a little Middle Eastern jaunt where he was very, very bullish about, I have told the Israelis that they mustn't, stop, mustn't kill so many civilians and, you know, we really want to get this hostage deal sorted out. And, and he came back empty handed. He came back humiliated. Everybody, everybody in the world can see that America's power over Israel has evaporated. And, and now, inside of America as well, inside America as well, realisation is beginning to dawn that it's not enough for America to simply tell Israel what to do. It actually has to do something to hurt Israel. And one of the most extraordinary things I think I've seen is the, uh, an interview was, uh, uh, last night on CNN. CNN, of all places. And it was with Josh Paul, who was, uh, you wouldn't have heard of him, I'd never heard of him. He is a very, 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 was a very, very senior State Department official. Like, and I'm, I'm talking incredibly senior. You look, you, look at his, you look at his CV on LinkedIn, and it is just like, for the past 30 years, he's worked in various different defense, security, state apparatus jobs. He is an absolute Washington insider. In October, late October, and this guy's job, by the way, amongst other things, is literally he is the guy who signs off on arms deals between America and Israel. He's the one who says, right, yes, okay, this deal is okay. We have a few conditions about how these weapons are used. Yes, fine. He resigned in, and is now openly saying that the course America is on is disastrous and America needs to cut off arms flows to Israel. Um, 
Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Who remembers Bernie Sanders? Eh? Now, he, he's been pretty useless. He's, he hasn't called for a ceasefire. He's always been useless on the question of Palestine. But he is now saying, I am going to vote against arms for Israel. And this is now a serious, serious split in the, in the, um, in the US State Department. Uh, Josh Paul reckons that he has, that there, there are hundreds of people who are calling for this. Every liberal institution in, in the world has got this, has got a version of this. Um, this dilemma in that the senior management, the people at the top, are desperately trying to shut up, get them to shut up, get them to tow the Washington line, get them to tow the pro-Israel line, and it's becoming increasingly impossible to hold that line. You know, um, the Guardian has recently put out new policy saying that its staff writers aren't allowed to sign public petitions about anything. You know, uh, you just imagine what what it is like if you're in the working in the Guardian. And you've got this tiny layer of senior managers up top who are just essentially trying to shut you up, whereas everybody around you knows what is going on. Everybody knows that's a genocide. Everybody knows that is a genocide authorised and backed at the top of our society. So this creates extraordinary pressures in liberal institutions. And I think, I think they are going to rise and rise and rise over the next, next few days and next few weeks. Um, in terms of what will happen, I think there will... There is a choice. There is a choice. One, one choice is barbarism, of course. Um, the US might decide that actually we can't pay the price of actually hurting Israel. We can't actually give them a public slap. We can't actually cut the arms trade, arms trade to them. The, one, the only thing that will actually hurt them. Uh, and if so, uh, I can't see much alternative for, apart from this situation escalating. And escalating, already there is quite a serious situation on the north, Hezbollah versus uh, Iran on the, the Lebanon border, elsewhere as well. Um, and uh, you know, the, the US knows this. I, I did mention earlier that the US knows that it does not want to get into a world war against the entire rest of the world, defending their least popular child. You know, at a time of Hamas's choosing. No, it does not want to do that. So, so while I'm one of natural, life's natural pessimists, because I'm 52 years old and you get that way, um, I, 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 don't, I, I think the US is going to have to do something. I, th I think at some point they're going to have to cut Israel loose. And that will be quite a moment when it happens. Um, but I, I, I want to just think through what might happen. If the US was to actually enforce its will on Israel in some way. Immediately, I think the immediate thing will be that it will cause a total psychic breakdown inside Israel. This, this, this society is completely fractured. It's got loads of different factions. I've been, I've been trying to kind of understand it and occasionally ask, you know, pro-Palestinian Israelis, who are this lot? Why are they like that? Why do these people hate these people? Uh, you know, you can, it is not a sane society. It is not a society that... Um, that uh, can function, and I think there will be a, be a kind a kind of collapse there that will will resonate around the world, and it will be extraordinary, extraordinary to see. Um, and when that happens, there will be a mighty, mighty battle over what happens next, because what the U.S. is trying to do, and that Josh Paul guy who talked on CNN, he 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 outlined very very openly what he thinks the alternative strategy, the plan B for US imperialism would be. I mean, he, he cares about the Palestinians, he cares about people, but he's mostly interested in preserving American imperialism. And his argument is that this course is disaster. We have to go down this course, no matter how, how hard it might be. Now, if that happens, you will see all of those liberal institutions that are currently saying, you have to call for ceasefire, this cannot go on, all of them will breathe a massive sigh of relief and then get on in bed with whatever the US is proposing. The US will try to impose a two-state solution of some sort or some kind of partition, some Bosnia-style solution. That is what it will try to do in the event that it manages to terminate this war. And a lot of those liberal institutions who are horrified, horrified, genuinely horrified by what is happening, will unfortunately then walk into that trap and start to back 
the US's latest imperial fix that is going to try to put on the people of Palestine. Now, this is a battle that is coming up, and I think in terms of the role that socialists can play and the role the left can play, one of the crucial things is we have to start winning arguments now that that is not a solution and that it is the people of Palestine and the spirit of Palestinian resistance and the actuality of Palestinian resistance that has won this much and they should be the ones deciding their fate. And I think we, 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 we need to start making those arguments now firmly but calmly so that when that battle happens, more of the, more of the radicalising liberals will, will come over to our side of the field, to put it very crudely. That, that is strategically, I think, what we want to see. I'll, I'll just end on one thing. I was, I was out, out for a drink with an old friend of mine who's my age, and he had a teenage son, uh, just turned 18. And he was saying, like, you know, Charlie, all his mates, they are all pro-Palestine. It is, it is the cause of their generation. They have looked at the world. They can see climate change. They can see this. They seen Palestine, and that is the cause they adopted. And it's exactly what we did when we were teenagers over South Africa. You know, when I was a teenager, I thought I would be happy to be fighting apartheid, being against apartheid for the rest of my life. And amazingly, like about, about in 1990, almost, almost miraculously, this South African state that had been crazy, that had been yelling and yelling that we are the last line of resistance against communism, we are the last line of resistance against Satanism. I mean, they were, they were very, very weird. The, the white South African subculture towards the, the dying days of apartheid. But the society collapsed. It, 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 and it collapsed incredibly rapidly. And it turned around incredibly rapidly in a way that, that I, I would not have believed possible, you know, in the middle of the 1980s. And I think that might happen now. What I can say with certainty is that there is no return to the status quo. Anyone who thinks we can just wind this back and kind of, oh, well, maybe just do that two-state solution that we were going to do at some point, no, no. Israel is never going to recover from this. The whole world can see and will not put up with this bullshit any longer. Their propaganda narrative is falling apart. I mean, you know, it's, it's really fascinating watch, watch American journalists actually just tearing apart these lies, going, well, well, hang on, that isn't what you said yesterday. Hang on, where are these 40 beheaded babies? You know. You're actually seeing that coming out now, that their propaganda's falling apart. The, the, whole, the, whole, the whole of their apparatus is, is, is wobbly. And we need to be able to see that, and we need to be able to understand it more clearly than our rulers do. Because we understand the process underneath, the process from below, uh, and the subjectivity from below, and the resistance from below, that is actually the secret key of the puzzle that is actually driving this whole process. So. We need to seize every little opportunity that comes. We need to recognise these as opportunities. These, these, are, these are wins, these are victories on our side. And we need to see that, that beneath the horror lies this other. And I have to say, I, I think we are on the verge of a world historic defeat for US imperialism. And the world will look very, very different going forwards than it has in the past. It will, the wars will continue, the struggles will continue. Um, but... We need to make sure that that defeat for US imperialism is also seen as a victory for the Palestinians, a victory for the Intifada, and a victory for all of us. And if we can seize that, we can really start to make history in the way that other speakers have said. Thank you for listening.